It is 2024. We don't need new movies or music. Let's just release more Marvel movies, more Star Wars shows, more sequels, more Call of Duty games, another Despicable Me, the same song copied and pasted across dozens of different artists in the same genre. It can all blend into one homogeneous consumer culture that keeps us hooked, and as long as we remain connected, we'll still fit in with other humans. See, consumerism plays a huge part in everything I just mentioned, and the over-commodification of everything in our lives is causing culture as a whole to erode, and for things that aren't profitable, productive, or easily digestible to be forgotten about or looked at as irrelevant. As stated by philosopher Mark Fisher in his book Capitalist Realism, our modern version of capitalism, which I'll simply be calling consumerism in this video, I realize that consumerism is a different idea, but I'm just going to simplify it. Anyways, he says that this idea has become so focused on profit and efficiency that culture has been turned into a product to be consumed instead of being used as a means of expression and exploration. Things seem to be losing their sense of identity in exchange for monetizable gimmicks that increase profits. Think about the idea of a Nicki Minaj skin being in the original Call of Duty Black Ops. This just wasn't even a conceivable idea in the early days of gaming. But today, these gaming crossovers that are focused solely on encouraging people to spend more money on microtransactions are diluting the identity of game franchises that have established themselves for decades. Of the artists and creatives who turn these concepts into reality in exchange for a quick buck. Of course, there's always good indie games, but when was the last time you actually saw a big budget AAA game franchise that was creative? And this is happening across our culture, not just in the digital or gaming space. Cities have lost the individual character of the inhabitants that established them, replaced by large glass corporate buildings that are cost effective and standardized to maximize profit, with a sweet green chain on every single corner. Restaurants and coffee shops have lost their focus on family recipes, attention to detail, and a friendly setting to create environments that minimize the amount of time that people spend inside, foods that could be standardized and made quickly, and aesthetics that could be copied and pasted across other locations and can go viral on TikTok with ease. Blockbuster movies are all sequels, AAA games are all sequels, and even a lot of musical artists are just releasing stuff to bring in extra money instead of out of a desire to create something new and exciting. In short, consumerism is killing our culture and fundamentally changing how we see the world. The world feels like it's losing its charm, exchanges feel meaningless, connections feel weaker, and our cities are becoming places to spend money, not places to live. And lately, I've been thinking a lot about this and about how to make the world feel somewhat beautiful again, and by the end of this video, you'll have some ideas on how to do the same. Let's start with algorithms. You may not realize it, but algorithms, including the one that recommended this video to you, have changed everything for us. Not just what we consume online in the form of music or games, it has seeped out of the screens and into our physical world. When was the last time you walked into a coffee shop and it looked charismatic, eclectic, and interesting? Something cool like Central Perk in the show Friends. Chances are, you probably haven't seen something like this in ages, if ever. The ones that you walk into on a regular basis probably look more like this. Concrete floors, dark wood tables, uncomfortable metal stools or chairs, and some industrial style lights hanging from the ceiling. Or like this, white metal tables, concrete floors, and a minimalist spotless interior that could be seen in a doctor's office. Where are the coffee shops with character? In short, algorithms have caused them to disappear. I'm currently reading a book called Filter World, How Algorithms Flatten Culture, and it talks about how these digital algorithms have actually changed our physical environments. How Instagram and TikTok aesthetic coffee shops have become so popular that the more unique, individualized ones have gotten replaced by ones that the digital algorithm would be more likely to pick up when shared online. These business owners know that people are attracted to a specific aesthetic online, so they design their spaces so that someone making an Instagram reel of their coffee shop would be able to go viral based solely on the aesthetic that it provides, instead of the quality of the food, coffee, or service. I'll link the books that I mentioned in this video in the description, using a website that promotes and supports local bookstores if you're interested in checking them out. But basically, the filter world, or the world that the algorithm ends up incentivizing, has become part of our physical world. And it's not only these coffee shops. I'll get to how these algorithms affect what you consume in a little bit, but first, I want to talk about how consumer culture is killing your real-world experiences. 
In the United States, your personal growth and productivity are two of the most important things, if not the most important things in your life. If you're not striving to make more money, do more things, try more restaurants, get out of your house more, climb the corporate ladder, etc., then you aren't living to your fullest potential. If you spend time playing video games, you're neglecting your ability to create a side hustle, travel the world, and make more money so that you can buy a cooler car. And our culture has caused us to feel guilty about this. Most of the time, when I sit down to watch a movie or a TV show, I feel bad about it for some reason. I need to be working on myself 24-7. Because of this cultural pressure to self-improve, people are becoming less social, less caring, and less neighborly. People are more likely to pass you by when they see your car broken down on the street than they are to help you. People don't want to be spoken to in public and put AirPods in so that nobody pays attention to them. Family values are thrown out the window for career progression, nobody's having kids anymore, and doing things with friends is uncommon unless it's something where you go out and spend money, like a bar or a restaurant. We used to get our identities from our communities or our role in society, but these days it comes solely from what occupation we have, what we spend 40 hours per week doing to generate the money that we use to buy things. If you ask someone to tell you about themselves in the United States, the first thing that they're probably going to say is what they do for work. Oh, I'm an accountant, a consultant, whatever. Your identity doesn't need to come from your family anymore because you were assigned a new one the second you joined the workforce. And as much as people pretend like this is what their sense of self comes from, being an accountant or being a consultant, it just isn't true. And that's what causes everyone to feel a massive void inside themselves and to feel as if they don't know what their purpose in the world is. By sacrificing these previous senses of self in exchange for a consumerist one focused on what generates money in your life, we aren't satisfied with ourselves anymore. So on one hand, we initiate a massive lifelong self-improvement project to try to find that satisfaction. If we hit the gym more, make more money, and do this and that, we'll finally feel like we have meaning in life. And in the meantime, since these processes are long and intense, we try to find a short-term meaning in the form of material purchases. So while we're working to get in better shape, we decide to form our identities around material goods. I'm the type of guy who buys a film camera and likes to skateboard. I'm the type of guy who plays League of Legends and listens to synthwave music. I'm the type of guy who blah blah blah. These material goods don't actually give us the satisfaction and sense of self that we think they will give, so we then work more to make more money in the hopes that the next purchase will finally be the one that does it for us. But it won't ever do that. For a culture to exist, shared values need to be passed down from one generation to another. And since those previous values have been shoved into the background behind the constant barrage of consumer items that we purchase to showcase our unique sense of self, the void inside of us continues to grow while our shared culture is on the decline in exchange for short-term profits. We don't have any shared values because we are all hyper-individualistic and focus primarily on our own personal growth over all else. We don't have a shared anything anymore, which causes us to be divided and distracted, and gives large corporations the power to come in, demolish what character the world has left, and replace it with something that will generate more revenue. There are no causes that people can collectively get behind to prevent these corporations from doing this, because the very fabric that holds us together, aka our culture, and our community, is gone. This is why our physical world, like those interactions I mentioned earlier, and more nuanced things like the way our cities are designed, feels odd. It's not made for humans anymore, it's made for consumption. Flashy new developments that have green space and retail and everything that makes our cities look better doesn't actually create community-oriented spaces. These spaces are meant for consumption, and if you were to show up and lay out a picnic basket, throw a football, and sit on a blanket in one of these urban environments, security will probably ask you to leave because you aren't actively consuming. Coffee shops are places to get coffee, not community hotspots like you see in Friends. Bars are places to drink alcohol with people you already know, not places to hang out, become friends with the bartender, and meet new people. Consumption drives not only our day-to-day -day actions, but also our environments and how they're being built and designed. These environments are what cause culture to evolve, and since they're so uncomfortable to be in, we turn to online outlets to build the community and culture that we're lacking in our personal lives. Platforms like Discord, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We consume content to reinforce our worldview and to make us feel like we're a part of something meaningful, but those somethings that we're a part of in the digital world are spoon-fed to us through an algorithm that doesn't care if you're actually gaining value from it or not. It only cares about profit. 
The way that algorithms suggest content online is based on what will drive the most clicks, the most engagement, and keep users on the apps for as long as possible to generate the most advertising revenue. Even this video was suggested to you by a system that wants you to watch it, not because it wants you to understand this information, but because it thinks that you would be interested in it enough to spend more time using their app. The algorithm's main purpose is to encourage people to consume, to consume more content, to consume more products, and to consume more ads. There's no denying this. So the popular things that will drive these results are highlighted, and the artistic, soulful things that were created for no reason other than to spread the artist's vision and message into the world are irrelevant. Thus, the culture is suppressed unless it results in more financial gain, which is why an artist like Taylor Swift, who has a team of agents, co-producers, co-writers, marketing people, and probably a billion other team members double-checking her every move to make sure she's releasing commercially viable music, is always going to be more popular online than someone with unadulterated niche talent like Maggie Rogers. Sure, Maggie Rogers still has a team, but the sheer volume of sales figures and profitability causes music like hers to get pushed to the back underneath a sludge of the 100 latest and greatest Taylor Swift and Sabrina Carpenter albums. As the consumer's consumption cycle continues to grow, the results of the commercially palatable artists become exponentially higher, and with algorithmically suggested streaming picking the popular things and showing them to more and more people, it shapes our preferences entirely until, next thing you know, everyone is into the same stuff and true artists are more and more niche. On the topic of music, I found something interesting. From the year 1981 to the year 2000, only two artists appeared as Billboard's top artists of the year more than once. Garth Brooks won in 1992 and 1993, and Backstreet Boys won in 1989 and 1990. Other than that, there was a new top artist every single year. So in 20 years, there were 18 different artists who were chosen as artists of the year. And it was all pretty diverse, ranging from Usher, a pop and R&B artist, to Bon Jovi, a rock band. It shows the creativity and progression of music as an art form. Now, from the 22 years between 2001 and 2023, there were only 15 different artists winning the number one spot, with many artists appearing two to three times each. And every single one of the artists on the list were either pop or hip-hop artists. There's no science to my claim here, but to me, it shows that consumer tastes continue to compound on each other in the age of the internet, and with algorithms pushing content that's more aligned with the taste of the average consumer, the creative fringes of whatever medium we're talking about grow more and more niche. It's weird, and it helps to explain why so many popular music artists sound the same these days. Sure, there are more ways than ever to find niche indie artists, but the chances of a small artist making a dent in our overall culture is pretty damn small. Because, well, the culture is established by what's most popular, and when the most digestible or easiest to consume and market stuff becomes the most popular, that's what sets the culture. And that's why our culture is starting to feel so boring and repetitive. But that's just music. Let's talk about video games. Here's a list of the best-selling games from the year 1995 until 2010, the days before algorithms decided what we consumed. Mortal Kombat 3, Super Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, Zelda Ocarina of Time, Donkey Kong, Pokemon Stadium, Madden 2002, GTA Vice City, Madden 04, GTA San Andreas, Madden 06, Madden 07, Guitar Hero 3, Rock Band, MW2, and Call of Duty Black Ops. All of these franchises only appeared on the list once except for Madden, Call of Duty, and GTA. The other top spots were held by different game franchises every single year. Now, let's look at 2011 to 2023. Modern Warfare 3, Black Ops 2, GTA 5 with COD Ghost in second, Advanced Warfare, Black Ops 3, Infinite Warfare, COD World War 2, Red Dead Redemption 2 with Black Ops 4 in second, Modern Warfare, Black Ops Cold War, Call of Duty Vanguard, MW2, and finally, Hogwarts Legacy, but with MW3 in second. 10 of the last 13 best-selling games were Call of Duty games, and every single year, Call of Duty has been in at least second place. Don't get me wrong, I have no issues with sequels, but the fact that these games remain top sellers, often by a lot of copies, while the market as a whole continues to grow, is concerning. Again, I love indie games, and honestly, I play smaller budget titles much more often than the big budget AAA games, but the fact that games that change gaming culture as a whole, the Undertales and Stardew Valleys of the world, are drowned out by copy and paste, low effort, ultra-monetized sequels means that these games, 
while still successful, are inevitably having a lesser impact on the market as a whole. The corporatized sequels suck attention away from these smaller games, and in exchange, more companies end up chasing the coattails of what works, rather than innovating and trying something that changes the gaming world. Each player who sticks with COD over new, exciting creative projects is one additional person who, instead of supporting projects that change gaming culture for the better, and allow for new ideas and concepts to sprout out from the market, is reinforcing the previous culture that's been successful for years. Thus, the culture itself isn't changing, and overworked game developers pumping out yearly microtransaction-filled sequels will continue to be the norm. And that's just with the songs and games we consume, which in the grand scheme of things are very minor points of what constitutes a culture. But let's dive into the big stuff, and then I'll talk about how we can keep our culture alive by resisting this system. Everything from these things that I just mentioned to the clothes that we wear are subconsciously curated from the algorithm suggestions, causing both the digital and physical world that we live in to change and shape itself around what sells best. The media we consume is often spoon-fed to us based on what the all-knowing algorithms find us most likely to spend the most time viewing, which again, in turn, allows for them to capture more data about us and sell us more things. Thus, like I said before, the things that catch on are the things that sell the most, causing our culture to go into the direction of the most profitable. But what does all this actually mean? Sure, it sounds all doom and gloom, but how is this actually affecting you and I? Well, first of all, these consumerist ideals are causing a culture homogenization where everything feels the same. It's harder than ever to keep your sense of identity because if you live in Chicago or Los Angeles, there really isn't that much of a difference. With this lack of identity, you lose your sense of belonging and are struggling to find where you fit into the generic world in which you live. This causes you to feel isolated and disconnected, because instead of the world being shaped by the people around you, their daily routines and their traditions, it's now being shaped by the large corporations who don't care about your community or sense of belonging. That social fabric that kept you grounded and made your life feel meaningful is gone now, and you're stuck trying to find meaning in other ways, which results in you spending money to craft your identity around consumer products, reinforcing the issue and sending you deeper and deeper into a sense of helplessness. With everything looking and feeling the same, your creativity declines and your ability to make things that bring you joy once again reinforces that cultural decline that consumerism causes, sending you into a downward spiral. Since you aren't creating anymore, you fill your time with consumption and you swallow down the uncomfortable feeling by detaching from the world and watching whatever TV show the algorithm suggests to you based on the artificial profile it created around your viewing history. And it's time to break free from this trap and make the world feel beautiful again. To connect with other humans outside the limitations of the consumerist world. To spread love, positivity, and creativity that helps to be the catalyst that brings back the culture that we're all longing for. It sounds grandiose and maybe a little cringe, but that's kind of what I want to do with this channel. My goal here is to show you that there is a way out of this annoying and uncomfortable system and that there is hope for a better personal existence. That you can still meet people, find new friends, date, and live a normal life like everyone has done for generations in a consumerist world. So if you want to be a part of this journey, consider subscribing to the channel to stay up to date with future video topics. But I told you I would provide some solutions on how to escape the grip of consumerism, so let's touch on that real quick. First of all, you need to stop optimizing your life for efficiency. I mentioned this in my video on why the world feels different now, which I'll link in the description if you want to watch. But basically, the easy path is not always the best path. Get out of your house and establish some traditions for yourself. Meet up with friends once a week to play board games or poker and chat. If you don't have friends in person, start participating in non-consumption-oriented hobbies to meet them. Pickleball, rock climbing, Magic the Gathering events, music listening parties, the gym, frequenting a local coffee shop, the list is endless. You need to get out of the house and establish your presence in the real world. The digital world is restricted based on what the algorithm determines about you, so bypass that altogether and stop outsourcing your interactions with other humans to large corporations who don't care about you. Take it upon yourself to meet people, break the ice, get out of your comfort zone, and build a community. It's going to take years, but if you don't try, I promise you it will never happen. With community comes your own little sense of self, your own group culture. This culture, when authentic, expands and attracts other people who are also looking for something meaningful, and with a group, you can craft your environment into what you want it to be. When you consume content, consume it intentionally. Don't just scroll until you find something that makes you not bored. 
Curate your feed based on what you know you want to consume, and only sit down and watch stuff when you plan on doing it. Curate your own music playlist and stop subscribing to what Spotify gives you. Watch movies that you hear about from other people or online communities, not reviews, and cut out all the stuff that makes you feel inauthentic. Don't outsource your life to algorithms. Don't use dating apps and talk to people in person, even if they think you're weird. I still believe you have a better chance at finding someone else who is weird like you if you try to talk to them in person. Cook your food, read books, and do things that make you feel as if you're actually a part of the physical world and not just a drone that exists only to look at screens and participate in an artificial world of consumption. These are some simple steps you can take to make your life feel like your own. If you have any questions about specific things I said, please let me know in the comments. I can't cover all of this stuff in detail in one video, and the whole plan with this channel is to take all of these topics and make it easily digestible, so please let me know what you want to see. I hope this video helps you to open your eyes on how the world really works these days, and that these brief solutions can keep you out of the trap of modern consumerist culture. If I helped you out, consider buying me a coffee by using the link in the description as I consume coffee, ironically talking about consumerist culture and I'm talking about consuming coffee, but I drink it every time I write these scripts, so your support goes a long way to make these videos possible. And if you want to check out the book about algorithms or capitalist realism that I mentioned early on in this video, both of which completely changed my perspective on literally everything, you can find them in the description as well. I hope you enjoyed this talk and we will talk again soon. Peace.